This week on Any Place Wild, my co-host Annie Getchell and I take a trip in our own backyard as we search for a town that disappeared over 80 years ago. We'll track the ghosts of Maine's granite industry where we enjoy some of the best sea kayaking in the world. I'm John Veeman. Join me for The Islands That Built America. Place Wild is made possible in part by Chevy Blazer. Next time you're having fun outdoors, make sure that Mother Nature has a good day too. And by Low Alpine, technical packs and apparel, and Low Pro camera bags. And LL Bean, providing sporting gear and apparel for people who love the outdoors for over 80 years. Our story begins in the Cathedral of St. John the Divine in New York City. It's an inspiring edifice built of thousands of blocks of granite hewn from the quarries on the islands of Penobscot Bay. The ferry boat from Rockland links the Isle of Vinylhaven to Midcoast, Maine. It's a pretty romantic way to start a kayak trip. Just a quick ride and we'll be on our own. We'll paddle and camp, island hopping through Penobscot Bay for three days to explore the area's lost granite trade and visit the site of an entire town that vanished. Check it out, the breakwater. I always feel like it's in the way of what I want to see. I want to see the mountains and the bay spread out before me. This obvious, straight, human-made thing. Mile long. Mile long. Took 20 years to complete, and around, right around the turn of the century. You know how many blocks of granite are in that thing? No idea. 80,000 blocks. 750,000 tons. How did you hold your breath that long? <laughs> <laughs> From the 1850s to the early 20th century, granite was the building material of choice. To spur reconstruction following the Civil War, the federal government guaranteed a 15% profit to quarry owners. If I recall, Maine was actually the, the largest uh, exporter of granite of all the states in the country. Well, it's easy to see why, because the ships could just come right up to the islands and, and, and um, easily transport it. This, this thoroughfare here was like a major interstate highway. And this highway led from Penobscot Bay to the Customs House in Boston, the Brooklyn Bridge in New York, the Washington Monument, the Post Office in Cleveland, and Union Station in Omaha. During the generations between the Civil War and the First World War, Maine shipped 800 million tons of granite as far west as the Missouri River and as far south as Havana, Cuba. Since then, the industry and its people have vanished. Annie and I are eager to get going. Fortunately, there's no trick to packing these boats. Just stuff, stuff, stuff. Yep. So why is it that up here on the coast of Maine there's so much of this granite? Well, these are granite intrusions. They formed deep inside the earth and cooled real slowly, made this really hard rock, and all the surrounding bedrock got carved away by the glaciers and weathered away with the wind and the water. So what we got left is these islands, which are really just mountaintops. And the different, there's different gradations of the granite, you know, different colors. Does that mean it just has a little bit different composition? Different grades, different textures. Granite forms real, uh, you know, beneath the surface, and so it, it cools real slowly, and so the crystals form very evenly. These intrusions are called plutons. Plutons? Yep. After the Greek god Pluto. Oh, yeah? God of the depths. And the reason they call them that is because they say these 
these uh, mountaintops really extend all the way to the fiery depths of the earth. We paddle out of the lee of Vinalhaven into a light headwind and chop, crossing to our first night's camp on Ram Island. Looks like our island, huh? Is that it up there? Be a nice and breezy island, though. No bugs. In Penobscot Bay, there are islands everywhere you look. But that doesn't mean you can camp on them. Most are private property. State-owned Ram Island is one of the few spots open to public use. Well, there sure are a lot of islands. There's like 3,000 off the coast of Maine, but not very many public islands at all, so you gotta be kind of sensitive about where you try to camp. Uh. Our goal is to leave no trace of our visit. We hide our tent in a thicket of trees. John pulls out a camouflage net to conceal our boats. Grab a corner over there. This yeah. is terrific. Yeah. Good idea. Really now everybody trees. else thinks they've got the place to themselves too. What do you got going over there on the stove? Well, Annie is a whiz when it comes to trailside cuisine. I'm probably the only guy who gains weight on backcountry trips. Simple. Look at that. Invisible, huh? Annie started the day with a cold dunking, but hey, it was her idea. Good, good, that was good. Ooh. How's the water? Ooh, ice cream <laughs> headache. <laughs> Can I try it again? Yep. Our plans for the day include some lively water. So John helps me practice a self-rescue technique that every kayaker should know, the Eskimo roll. One more time. Mastering the Eskimo roll isn't as easy as Annie makes it look. Excellent. It takes finesse and lots of practice. For those without a roll, you can still get back in with a little help from your partner. And when I paddle in the frigid waters of Penobscot Bay, I want to get back in my boat quickly. Once I'm over, I pop my spray skirt and roll out. Annie helps me right my boat with as little water in it as possible. Now for the tricky part. I use Annie's boat for leverage and squirm feet first back into the cockpit. Just hold the boat. It's not very graceful, but hey, I'm in. And then comes the bilge pump water fight. Uh, we got a little bit of water in here, but... Yeah, put it in my boat. Hey, there's a nice little tidal rip up here we can have some fun in. Now that we've practiced our rescue skills, we're ready for that lively water Annie was talking about. On the way to the old quarry, we'll go through tidal rapids, fast-moving white water that first flows one way, then the other with the change of the tide. The power is awesome. On this one, nearly 100 million gallons flows through every six and a half hours. Okay, enough fun. Time to get back to our quarry hunt. Well, that's uh, one of the places where they were loading up all the stone and the big ships had to come up to it. That thing is massive. You know these big blocks of granite on this loading area is a pretty good clue that there's a Nice big quarry around here. John Beeman, Adventure Sleuth. Where are you taking me? Oh, Annie. <laughs> oh, hey, look at this. 
cool. Another... Oh, you know what? Minute. They're granite paving stones. Aha. Uh -huh. Cobblestones, right? Yeah, cobblestones, you know? It's what you it's what they put on the streets to kind of make them less muddy back in the old days. Well, it was in the old days too, because look at all the moss and stuff growing up in there. Yeah, those that pile's been there a while. Somebody never made their 15% off those, huh? Ah, another clue. Well, look at this. They were cutting right in here. Look, they take these feathers here and they just jam a wedge down and go along every couple inches and just sort of score the surface in the shape they wanted. And then eventually the whole thing would just like poop, pop. Crack under its own weight. Yeah. Yeah, here's some evidence of another technique they used to get this granite broken up. Big holes they'd bore and then they'd throw blasting powder or dynamite down in there. Let her rip, and then boom, the whole thing would just. <laughs> You'd like that, wouldn't you? <laughs> It'd be kind of fun to watch. Must have really made a racket. Yeah, it made a racket, but you know, it was a business. They were in a hurry to get it done. There's probably some more holes around here somewhere that show you what it looks like before they blast off. Yeah, here's some. Look at this right here. They're starting another another line. This is actually an old bit I bet stuck down in there. Oh man, I bet that thing goes down some distance too. Well, here's one of those giant pillars. Look at the size of this thing. It's got to be like 20, 24 feet long. This column is actually five feet wide and 30 feet long, and is only one half of one of the columns commissioned for the Cathedral of St. John Divine. Eight columns were commissioned, but the first three broke on the lathe, so the columns were turned in smaller pieces and assembled on site. Still, the columns were so tall that they were put in place first, and the church was built around them. Ah, another clue. Monster cables, look at these things. Cutting, carving, and moving mammoth blocks of granite was a nearly unimaginable task. It took brains, brawn, and a bit of dynamite. Blocks of granite were cut from rock faces with hammers and wedges, and carved with chisels and steam-driven tools. But cutting the stone was only half the challenge. Moving the stone took real ingenuity. That was on the end of the derrick. I think they had three cables running through there. Central to the operation was the derrick. This was the apex of a series of cables that ran to all corners of the quarry to help lift and move granite blocks, some as large as 300 tons. They were moved using a contraption called a gallimander, it was basically a lever on wheels that could hoist 15-ton slabs and carry them through town to the waiting schooners. Steam-driven derricks hoisted the blocks on board. At sea, the schooners were sluggish and unstable, so the crew slept topside to avoid getting caught below deck if one went down. Oh, this is something up here. Whew. What a view. Look, is that the Camden Hills over there? Yeah. Yeah. This is what they left behind. Imagine what they took. Yeah. Well, that's what I was going to say. It looks like there's stuff cut over there that they hadn't hauled away yet. It just sort of got stopped in midstream or something. That must mean they, they hauled it down that way to the ships. So there must be some tracks or rail or something in there that, with cable that they got it down. What makes a sea kayak so unique is that it lets you poke around the intertidal zone and spot creatures you'd never be able to see any other way. A lot of starfish along here. Look at that in the light. The time of day just before the sun sets is what photographers call the magic hour. The light intensifies everything and colors jump out at you. It's an inspiring time to paddle and oftentimes to reflect. Things I never was intrigued by when I was a kid. I just didn't have the opportunity to poke around in tide pools and look at shells and see lots of dead things. You know, here there's so much life all the time. 
that you're just constantly faced with dead stuff. And I find I'm really curious about it. I look at the skeletons and I pick up the bones and I wonder about them and I see how joints work. The kayaks are sort of one of those things I discovered when I was, I guess what you'd call an adult. Although I still wonder sometimes whether I qualify. I guess because adults, they always thought of as they weren't supposed to have so much fun. Sea kayaking is a lot of fun. And to discover it in late in life, it's sort of introduced a whole new dimension. This light reminds me of a copper Eskimo poem. And I think over and over again, my small adventures, when with a shore wind I drifted in my kayak and thought I was in danger. My fears, those small ones I thought so big for all the things I had to get and to reach. And yet there is only one great thing, the only thing, to live and to see in huts and on journeys the great day that dawns and the light that fills the world. important thing. <laughs> uh, morning. <laughs> morning. Tea water is that almost what? coming. Our campsite is a cozy hobbit hole tucked into weathered granite boulders. In the morning quiet, it's tough to imagine this place ringing with the sound of hammers and steam drills. Quarrymen sliced off Bald Island, once 150 feet high, right down to the high tide line to make the breakwater we passed back in Rockland Harbor. All that's left are the bones of an island. You know, it's pretty deep right here, so they could probably bring the boats right up to the edge and just sort of lift the stones right on from where they were quarrying. The next leg of the trip is an open water crossing from Bald Island to Hurricane Island. There's nothing more exhilarating than surfing the swells around ledges on a rising tide than skating down the backside of the waves. crossing to Hurricane Island. It's here that we'll search for signs of the town that disappeared. Hurricane Island was bought in 1870 by a retired Civil War general for $50. A veteran of the Battle of Bull Run, General Davis Tilson ran his company and his island with military authority. He owned the quarry, the town, and everything in it, fire department, general store, churches, and boarding houses. A granite cutter's pay was pretty good for its time, about $3 a day. But Hurricane was a notorious company town whose 1,200 citizens owned no property, could be fired on a moment's notice, and whose wages were paid in scrip to be used at the company store. So John. Yeah? When I was looking through some old photos of people who used to live out here, mm -hmm. I found this map. It's the Hurricane Island Town Plan from 1910. Oh, this is great. They oh, had a look bank, at this. bowling alley, a bowling ice alley. house. It shows where all these places were. Yeah. 
Oh, this is sort of like a little treasure map, isn't it? Yep, quite a community. Yeah. The town that disappeared. Hey, here it is. The main boiler right here. It's a squirrel condo. Yeah. It is now, but back then, it kicked out a lot of steam. But well, that's where the squirrels live that churned this thing. Yeah, well, I, I don't think so. I think all the guts of the system was right here in these compressors. This is where all the high-pressure steam was generated, and then they'd send it through a network of pipes and plumbing to workstations and other parts of the island. So they had a whole system of workers here, too, not just stone cutters. They had machinists and tool makers and... Stokers. Stokers. That would have been a hot job, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Pretty big quarry. Yeah. Well, it makes sense. They'd have the cutting shed right where they could pull the stone out. Yep, and here's a finished piece of stone right over here. Oh, and this must be where the railroad tracks were. They'd move the stone right along here. And the building, the building was 400 feet long. No you know. kidding. Yeah. yeah. Hurricane Island was known for its fine finishing work. Intricate carving and polished facades were turned out with great pride by the carvers. Chip by chip, chunks of the island were transformed into ornate sculptures like gargoyles, eagles, and winged messengers. But these ham-fisted, burly workmen are hardly the picture of the sensitive artist. Well, this is a good size cellar hole. What do you think was on top of this? Well, this is a boarding house. Was a boarding house. A boarding house? Yep, one of six for the unmarried laborer guys. The men who worked on the island were segregated by skill. Italians and Scots were the master carvers. Swedes cut paving blocks. And the guy with the steadiest hands worked the dynamite. Boarding houses were also segregated by nationality. Italians with Italians, Swedes with Swedes, Finns with Finns. Well, John, this is a really fancy house. So this was the big boss house, the superintendent's house. Oh, yeah. Well, he ran the whole island. And actually, he was the son of the first super. But he knew everything that was going on. Strict, powerful, energetic. And tragically stricken with typhoid fever in 1914. When he died, the island was leaderless. At the same time, another calamity hit the people of Hurricane Island. A ship carrying six months' production of stone sank in Rockland Harbor. The granite business on all the main islands had been diminishing since the turn of the century because of the advent of reinforced concrete and a change in building styles. Adding to the island's problems, railroads were becoming a cheaper way to transport granite than by sea. All these factors led to a sudden decision by the owners of the Hurricane Island Granite Company. Operations would cease effective immediately. Within three days, the town, the entire island, was deserted. No more quarrymen, no cooks, no pipe fitters, no dances or picnics, no stokers, no more carvers. All this stuff and nothing's left, just the ghosts. Yeah, ghosts and the granite foundations. It's really poetic when you consider that granite was the foundation of the whole island. All the way. <laughs> foundations are still being built here. Now the island is home to the Hurricane Island Outward Bound School. That's a fitting turnaround for an island whose value was measured only by the stone that could be extracted. What's taken away today are the ideas, the values of stewardship, conservation, and self-reliance. So what are you making there? Well, a little collage to remember this trip. I can't really take an island in my backpack, so... We'll just take a piece of granite with me. Yeah. <laughs> So what do you think all this granite business we're seeing here? Well, you turned my mind a little bit. Yeah? Well, I 
appreciate your perspective on all this too. Thank you. Definitely there's great value in just seeing these islands as they are naturally. To learn more about Any Place Wild and the Great Outdoors, check out PBS online at www.pbs.org. Place Wild is made possible in part by Chevy Blazer. Next time you're having fun outdoors, make sure that Mother Nature has a good day too. And by Low Alpine, technical packs and apparel, and Low Pro camera bags. And L.L. Bean, providing sporting gear and apparel for people who love the outdoors for over 80 years. This is PBS.